This is a very well-meaning piece of garbage. <laughs> Let's listen to it, and we'll talk about why. What is the difference between Christianity and Catholicism? Number one, Catholicism teaches that you are baptized as a baby, but we know that when you have faith in Christ and you repent from your sins, that's the day you're baptized. See, a baby cannot do either of these things. Point number two. So first off, baptism. Uh, Catholic Church does not teach that you are baptized as a baby, uh, though I know what you're trying to say. The Catholic Church teaches that babies can, in fact, be baptized because, as we see in the New Testament, uh, baptism is the sacrament that brings you into the faith. It is baptism, as Paul says in Colossians, that replaces circumcision. In the Old Covenant, it was circumcision that brought you into the covenant, at least if you were a boy. Girls obviously could not be circumcised. And just as in the Old Covenant, when it originally began, everyone was circumcised. Everyone from eight days old, which is interesting because that's when your blood clotting factor becomes a, a thing with vitamin K in your body, um, all the way up through the oldest man, right? Uh, every single person was circumcised. But after that initial round, in general, circumcision was only given to babies. It was pretty rare for there to be Jewish converts. Not impossible, but it was it was fairly rare that you would have Jewish converts. And so uh, for Paul to call baptism the new circumcision should immediately evoke this idea of something that is applicable to everybody, but once everybody has been brought into the faith, it normally belongs to uh, babies to be to be baptized. He, by, by calling it the new circumcision, he is telling you that this is something that is for everybody, just as circumcision was for all ages, uh, at least eight days. In fact, in the early church, there was a dispute or an argument about uh, circumcision, uh, or sorry, about baptism and, and, and whether or not babies should receive it or not. But it wasn't whether they should receive it. It was whether you had to wait the customary eight days or not. And the church ruled, no, you don't need to wait eight days. You can baptize them as soon as they are born. Um, and this actually harkens to a lot of other things we see in scripture. You like to think that your faith is entirely up to you and nobody else. We already know faith is a gift from God. So it's already at least in part up to God. But what scripture tells us in lots of different places is everybody has a role in every, other people's salvation. That's why in, in Mark chapter two, when they bring the paralytic to Jesus, what it says is when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the men bringing the, the paralytic to Jesus, he says to the boy, your sins are forgiven. That boy's sins were forgiven based on the faith of his friends. And in, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul tells us that the unbelieving spouse is made holy by the believing spouse. Catholicism teaches that you can pray to angels, you can pray to Mary, but we know that in Christianity you pray to God and God alone because there's one mediator between man and God, and that is Jesus Christ. Point number. So Catholicism teaches that the body of Christ is one. And Paul teaches in the Bible that we all are intercessors for each other. We all should be praying. In fact, you give us the quote uh, from 1 Timothy 2, uh, that there's one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. But if you read the four verses right before that, it says we are all to be intercessors, which is a lower form of mediatorship in a sense. We are all to be praying for everyone, including secular rulers in Paul's own words, right? Because God wills the salvation of all. And if you read Revelation, it shows you in Revelation, I think it's 5, 3 and 8, 5, uh, both the elders in heaven and the angels in heaven presenting this, the prayer of the saints on earth as incense to God. So they have a role in helping us to present our prayers to God. And so as Catholics, it's no different when we ask the body of Christ that is in heaven. Uh, that have gone before us, who fought the good fight, uh, because the, the prayers of the righteous availeth much, as James says, it is no different uh, to ask them to pray than it is for me to ask you to pray for me. And the word prayer uh, in English can have different meanings. And in modern Protestant English, it tends to be synonymous with the phrase worship. But the word pray just means ask. Pray, tell me. Did you think prayer and worship were always the same? Because they're not. Your Honor, the, the, the defendant prays the court to have mercy, right? In fact, if I say your worship, <laughs> the defendant prays the court to have mercy. It means to ask. It's all it means. And so when we pray to Mary or pray to the saints, what we're really doing is asking them to pray with us, just as if I ask you to pray with me or to pray for me. Three, Catholicism teaches this thing called purgatory. It's a place that you go to to be cleansed before you enter heaven. But we know that if Jesus dealt with our sin on the cross once and once for all, we don't need to be cleansed anymore. He's paid for it all. He's made us righteous, he made us blameless, and he made us holy. This again is a distortion of the biblical message, right? Because at the end of the day, what Jesus did 
was the complete work of what needed to happen in order for our entire salvation and sanctification to happen. But sanctification is a process that we begin in this life and is not completed in 99.9% .9 of us in this life. And the way you can know this is, do you still struggle with any kind of sin at all? Do you still struggle with any kind of temptation at all? Or are you actually literally perfect and could be no better in this life? Because if you are actually literally perfect in this life and could be no better than bully for you, but most of us are just not there. The lived experience of humanity tells you we struggle with sin. That's why we see in scripture a number of things, including, uh, and I'll, I'll mention this in the next point you're going to say, uh, what James talks about. Uh, he tells uh, you know, the, the people to confess their sins to one another. Um, he speaks of the anointing of the sick and he says, uh, if anyone is anointed and he's speaking to the church about this, their sins will be forgiven. We have sins. And John tells us if we say we have no sin, we are liars, right? So we still struggle in this life with sin, but in heaven, there will be nothing imperfect. There will be nothing unclean in heaven. And so we know that there is some sort of a change that happens between the moment we exit this mortal plane and the moment we truly step into eternity where we are refined, we are purified, we are cleansed of all attachment to sin. You might even say purged of that attachment to sin. And that's all Catholics mean when they talk about purgatory is there is a change between this life and the next life that cleanses us of all desire and attachment to sin. Paul references this in 1 Corinthians 3 when he talks about the day disclosing every man's works. And every man, you can only build on the foundation that is Jesus Christ, but a lot of us build crap on it, <laughs> wood, hay, and straw. But other times we build good stuff on it as well. Precious stones, silver, and gold, I think are the, the, the images that Paul uses. And he says that day will disclose every man's work. And whatever he's built, it'll be tested. And if it's wood, hay, and straw, it'll be burned away. And if it's the good stuff, it'll be refined. It'll be there. And that's what we even see in scripture. God is called a, a refining fire in a lot of ways, right? Um, and so this isn't something anti-scriptural. That's why Paul actually prays for his friend Onesephorus, um, who had died at one point. He says, I pray on the day of, of judgment that he himself might find mercy. Even though Onesephorus was his friend and had been very loyal to Paul, Paul is still praying for his friend. This is an early Christian practice. And in fact, if you look at the graves and the tombs and the catacombs of the early Christians, you'll find two different things. You'll find Christians asking for prayers on behalf of the dead who had died, saying, please pray for my brother that he might find mercy in the before the seat of God, and also asking those same people, uh, especially the ones that died as martyrs or whatnot, to pray for them as well. So again, you see, uh, you see this in the early church, this idea that the body of Christ is one, and that we and those beyond do have a relationship. Um, and we see that, again, in lots of places in Scripture. In fact, I have an entire video all about uh, the idea of, of the saints in prayer to us and how innate this is to Scripture, but how you can easily miss it if you're not well versed. Point number four, Catholicism teaches that you need to go see a priest to be forgiven, and it's called confession. And see, we know that through Jesus Christ, we have direct access to God. We do not need to see another person to be forgiven. Except that's not what Jesus says. In fact, Jesus, uh, after he's resurrected, meets with his 11 remaining apostles. Judas obviously is not with them. And he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. This is in John 20, 21. Uh, as the Father sent me, so I send you. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven, and whoever sins you retain are retained. Now, in order to retain sins or forgive sins, you got to know what they are. So this is right there explicitly confession. Uh, and then again, we see James referencing this as well. He says, confess your sins to one another. That does not mean that when we do wrong, we shouldn't immediately uh, confess to God. We, we should. In fact, the church teaches this. You should always immediately upon falling into sin, confess your sins to God, make an amends, seek to do right. But Jesus knows that we struggle with sin. And even after baptism, even after receiving faith, we're going to struggle with sin. And so he gives us basically... Uh, what we need. It, it, it's, it's, in fact, I'm told that Sigmund Freud modern, modeled the idea of psychoanalysis on confession because he found that his uh, Catholics, and he was an atheist, right? But he said the Catholics seemed to be better adjusted than the Protestants. And he reasoned that it was because they did this confession thing. And while he thought there was no merit in the sacramental side of it, obviously, uh, he thought that there was something to be said about uh, you know, the, the accountability of, of speaking your sins out to someone else and hearing the words you are forgiven out for him. It was just talking through your problems, right? But if Jesus is the divine physician, so much more, Jesus is also the divine psychologist. He knows what we need. He knows we need to hear that. And so he gives us these sacraments, which are conduits of grace in this life that we, through our participation in grace, receive more grace. And lastly, I would say Catholicism is a mix between man's tradition and the word of God, whereas Christianity is based solely upon the word of God. 
No, no, it's not. And I can prove that to you really, really quickly. Um, when Jesus is ascending into heaven, he doesn't lean over the cloud and say, by the way, there's going to be 27 books written. And those 27 books are going to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Nowhere in scripture can you find scripture telling you that scripture alone is your authority. And nowhere in scripture can you find anything that tells you what books belong in scripture. To even appeal to the New Testament, which the earliest church didn't have, is to make an appeal to the tradition of that same church that you're trying to reject. And in fact, if you can't fathom your church functioning without a New Testament, then your church is not the New Testament church because the New Testament church functioned without a New Testament. That's all I got to say.